Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates, and here at No Limits, we want to help strengthen you, encourage you, and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin, and I want to thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 is where our preaching consideration will come from today. I want to read in your hearing verses 18 through 25 of the gospel according to Luke. Where the word of the Lord reads as follows. It says, a certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And that ruler replied, well, I've kept all of these things since my youth. <clears throat> and when Jesus heard that, he said unto him, there is still one thing missing. I want you to sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the man heard this, he became sad for he was very rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 I want to try to preach today from the thought when prosperity becomes a problem. Amen. When prosperity becomes a problem. Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. <clears throat> oh, neighbor. Sometimes prosperity becomes a problem. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord some praise today. When prosperity becomes a problem. Last month, a female rapper by the name of Saweetie sparked a social media controversy when she made a comment about the role of women in relationships. She boldly declared to women on Instagram Live that if your man ain't buying you a Birkin and paying your bills, ladies, send him back to the streets. For the uninitiated, a Birkin is a reference to a designer handbag that can range anywhere from $30,000 to $100,000 or more. These bags have become common in recent years among a subset of social media influencers and entertainers as symbols of success, style, and exclusivity. Her point, as many uh, people took it, was that a man demonstrates and proves his value to a woman based upon the things he buys for her and whether he is able to subsidize her lifestyle. For the moment, I will temporarily suspend my judgment and assessment of this relationship counsel that is unfortunately becoming quite commonplace in too many circles. For I want my own daughters to aspire to buy their own stuff Amen. and to be able to pay their own bills without being subservient to or dependent upon a man. But I digress. Amen. This Birkin controversy raises questions not just about how people view relationships in modern society, but it also reveals the ways in which so many people today are sadly attached to and entangled by the wrong things. <clears throat> Rather than establishing good character, integrity, and love for God as key features of a good relationship, popular culture is glorifying big houses, banging bodies, and dollar bills as essentials for success in life. And if we are not careful, this emphasis on that which is surface, transient, and superficial can lead us into financial bondage and can distance us in our relationship with God. Materialism and financial entanglements 
are the kind of things that can literally sneak up on you and before you know it, you can find yourself overwhelmed by stress and drowning in debt and struggling just to survive. According to statistics, more and more Americans are struggling with delinquencies, bankruptcies, and foreclosures now than they ever have at any point in history. But financial trouble is more than simply a matter of poor choices and behavior. According to our text today, it is the product of poor public policy and bad systems as well. Here was a rich government official of some sort who had influence, power, and prestige in his community, and he approached Jesus one day and asked, Sir, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to get closer to God? And Jesus tells the man, well, follow the Lord's commandments, to which the man replies with an implied sense of pride and arrogance. Oh, if that's all that is required to get closer to God, if that's all that's required to have kingdom life and living, well, I'll see you in heaven because I've kept all of those things since I was a boy. Then Jesus Sensing the man's self-righteousness says, is that right? Well, then if you have done all of that, there is one thing that remains. I want you to sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and then your treasure will be in heaven. Then you can follow me. And the Bible says that when the rich ruler heard this, he became very sad because he was very rich. If you were unable to detect the entanglement in this story, then perhaps Eugene Peterson's paraphrase will make it clearer for you. The text reads in verse 23, this was the last thing that the official ever expected. He was very rich and became terribly sad because he was holding on so tight to a lot of things he was not able to let them go. For the next few moments that are ours, I want to probe this passage because in a culture like ours that places a premium on riches, possessions, and, mo and uh, things uh, as an indication of one's favor, I think it's important that we put money and material things uh, in their proper perspective. Because too many of us get swept up and swept away by deceptive gimmicks and distorted worldly preoccupations that can take us away from our relationship with God. I see it all the time. Well-intentioned believers getting caught up in get-rich-quick Ponzi and pyramid schemes that go under the guise of making one rich, when in reality they are a quick path to financial ruin. We must deal with this mindset as well. Because predatory preachers have given cover for this with a theology of consumption, one that teaches people the false and unbiblical doctrine that God wants all of us to be rich. And for them, this is symbolized by the kind of house you live in, the kind of car you drive, the kinds of trips you take, and the kind of clothes that you wear. And rather than praying for people, many of these prosperity predators have begun praying on people by idolizing money, the God of the world. Sadly, the church has lost its way by doing the very thing that Jesus cautioned against in Matthew chapter 6 by saying that you cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. And without a biblical foundation, people seem to be willing to do just about any and everything just to live this here lifestyle, as Young Thug says. What I find so shocking about this man's attachment to money is that it was so strong that he was even willing to risk his relationship with God. He was so attached to the chariot he drove, the coins in his bank, and the riches that he had, that it caused him to walk away from his relationship with God. And I cannot help but here Jesus asked that profound and provocative question found just a few chapters earlier in Luke chapter 9, verse 25, where Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he is going to lose his soul? Amen. Do you realize, my friends, 
that you can actually love money so much that it can override your relationship with God. Do you know that you can be so enmeshed with material things, uh, the things of the world, uh, that it can cause you to compromise your morals and your conventions, uh, all for a purse, all for a bag, and all uh, for a new car? That's precisely what happened to the brother in our text. He was so preoccupied with pursuing his career. He was so bent on making and maintaining money. He was so obsessed with amassing wealth that it became a spiritual problem and so the question becomes how do we keep from becoming victims of the money trap how do we reach a point in our lives where prosperity does not become a problem well first of all you have to keep wealth in its proper perspective that's my first point to be clear church there is nothing inherently wrong with wealth according to scripture Proverbs 28, 20 says, a faithful man will be richly blessed. Having money in and of itself doesn't seem to be inherently condemned in the word of God. We just need to remember that Jesus warned us in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, that happiness is not obtained in the abundance of things. In other words, Jesus wants us to know that stuff can make you happy. Come on, type that in the comment section. Stuff cannot make you happy. Having money isn't the problem. It's when money has you. It is not the mere possession of money that presents the ethical dilemma. It's when money and, and things possess us. While money is a means of survival in life, it is not an end in and of itself. And this brother in the text lost that perspective. He made the mistake of viewing money as the source of life rather than a resource in life. <laughs> Many are guilty of the same miscalculation of make, making money an idol, elevating things to godlike status by placing more value on what they drive rather than on what's driving them. See, you can have a Gucci bag and still lack character. You can drive a wraith and still be a horrible human being. And you can tell when people have misplaced priorities, when they are trying to garner attention for their desire labels, but they can't even pronounce the name of the designer, calling Hermes Hermes or Chanel Channel. Yes, I have actually heard a celebrity say that, but I won't name names. Don't be like this man. Don't try to hide behind designer labels in order to compensate for what you are and what you lack on the inside. There's nothing wrong with nice things. I like nice things, but don't reach a point where you think things can validate who you are. I'm not really sure that Jesus really wanted the man to give up all of his possessions or that if he did, Jesus would not have just given it all back. I think that what he wanted was for him to give up his attachment to his possessions. Jesus was trying to teach the man that he was somebody apart from his money and his nice things. And you and I know people like that, people who spend money that they don't have to impress people who aren't even thinking about them, and it's all because they are attached to the sense of personhood and validation that they think their belongings can bring them. Jesus was revealing to the rich ruler how he had allowed money to become a proxy to avoid what he lacked on the inside. Jesus was trying to show him and us that money does not change or make you who you are. It reveals who you are. Because I've discovered uh, that an insecure man without a car will still be an insecure man in a BMW. A bitter woman barefoot is still uh, going to be a bitter woman with red bottoms on. Uh, all I'm saying is uh, don't conflate your self-worth to your net worth. <laughs> so come on, type that in the comment section. Don't conflate your self-worth to your net worth. See, when the Lord came looking for Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10, when God appointed him to be king, the Bible says that they could not 
find Saul because he was hiding among his stuff. Listen, church, has God made you a king? Has God made you a queen? Has God positioned you for rulership and greatness and power, but you can't be found because you are hiding among your stuff? Are you trying to mask who you are behind YSL and Tom Ford or your favorite designer? Here was a little man living in a big house, and it kept him from experiencing the kingdom of God. Prosperity becomes a problem when you don't have your money in its proper perspective. But prosperity can also become a problem when it hinders social progress. That's my second point. We don't exactly know how this brother obtained his wealth. But what we do know is that his wealth wasn't able to fulfill that deeper yearning in his soul. This is why he came to Jesus in the first place, inquiring about the kingdom, because his chariots, his clothes, his palace could gratify, but they could not satisfy. You've heard it before, but it bears mentioning again, there are just some things in life that money cannot buy. It can buy you a house, but it cannot buy you happiness. It can buy you food, but it cannot buy you fulfillment. It can buy you a bed, but it cannot buy you rest at night. It can buy you an education, but it cannot buy you enlightenment. It can buy you company, but it cannot buy you love. It can buy you things and plenty of things, but money cannot buy you peace of mind. This man was in search of something that his money cannot buy. He wanted something more, something deeper, something that was not for sale, and that his money could not afford him. Even his fable attempts to keep the law were futile, and so Jesus told him that there was something else that was lacking in his life. The Lord told him he had to give up his attachment to things in which he had placed his value. <laughs> And Jesus said, I want you to go out and give the proceeds to the poor. This, my friends, was too much for the brother to handle. So much so that he was willing to risk salvation. He was willing to forfeit his place in paradise because he benefit, benefited from the economic system that provided his wealth. Let me be clear. This was not a man who earned his wealth from hard work and entrepreneurship. As a rich ruler, he made his wealth off of the backs of other people. I need y'all to listen. As an official appointed by the emperor of Rome, his lifestyle was earned by levying heavy taxes on the people. He was involved in a pyramid arrangement that enabled him to reap enormous profits by exploiting the public's labor. This text then is not a critique of someone who became wealthy because uh, they made an invention. Instead, it is a critique of an economic system that allows a few people to extract wealth off of the hard work and the labor of the masses. If you want to get into the kingdom, Jesus is saying, uh, you got to commit to changing and to overturning the system of economic exploitation uh, that allows you to unjustly profit off of the backs of other people like a pyramid scheme. Y'all aren't here. If you want to get in the kingdom... <laughs> If you want to get close to God the Father, you got to commit to establishing a kingdom economy. If you want to get in God's kingdom, he says, you must commit to an economic order that doesn't just allow a few people to be rich. But you got to commit to one that provides resources and abundance for everybody. Jesus said, I came that they might have life. And that they might have it not to be rich, but they might have it more abundantly. Where there are resources for everybody. The, the issue Jesus is after here, church, isn't about charity. Because you can give charity and still not change the system. This is the challenge of our contemporary world today. 
We live in a world today in which eight families, six of them in the United States, have as much combined wealth than half of the world's population. We live in a country where 90% of the nation's economic gains go to the top 1%. We live in a land where the average employee needs to work an entire month just to earn what the wealthiest CEO earns in one hour. This is the system that Jesus is challenging, a system that allows wealth to be concentrated through manipulation of the tax code, through deregulation and loopholes in the law, a system that privatizes profits and socializes the risk, a system that extracts wealth from the masses and siphons it into the pockets of the financial sector. The issue wasn't that the ruler was rich. It was how he obtained his riches. <laughs> he wasn't a hardworking businessman. He wasn't a businessman. He was a con man. He, he made billions and paid only $750 the year he got elected. Sorry, wrong leader, wrong leader. But you get my point. This man thought the Lord only required holding the Bible. He thought the Lord only required coming to worship. He thought the Lord only required wearing religious symbols. He did not realize that Jesus wanted him to live what was in the Bible. It is a book that calls for a radical reorientation of the systems of injustice and equality that produces profits by leeching off of the poor. Prosperity becomes a problem when it impedes social progress. When prosperity for you poses a barrier and an obstacle to the well-being of someone else. Whether it's the bank that receives profits from communities but doesn't reinvest in those same communities or the politician who supports tax cuts for the rich while simultaneously cutting programs to the poor, or the preacher who pimps the people in order to subsidize his lifestyle. It's a problem because it impedes the progress of society. And it all stems, church, from having the wrong priorities. Prosperity becomes a problem when people get their priorities out of order. Yeah. Yeah. Intimacy with God and not possession of things should be our ultimate goal in life. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He said uh, that we should seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all of these other things uh, shall then be added unto us. From all appearances, uh, the brother in the text has his priorities uh, out of line. Because nothing should be more important than our relationship with God. Can I get some help here? Not, no amount of money, no relationship, no car, no house, no possession, no position should ever or could ever take place in our lives of the Lord. And whenever we allow things to get between us and God, then those things in fact become our gods. <laughs> They become idols in our lives. And anything that you put ahead of God becomes an idol. Are y'all listening? It sort of reminds me of the first time I went to Turkey back in 1998. I was on this five-week archaeological tour uh, with my graduate class there at Harvard Divinity School. And we were there studying the early Christian sites in Greece and Turkey. And I'll never forget one day going to this one location where we were studying the ancient Greco-Roman gods that were worshipped during the time of the New Testament. And that, that day, while we were on site, I'll never forget picking up this little clay figurine. I'll never forget holding that figurine in my hand, it was one of the gods that they worshiped back in antiquity. And I bumped into something and I dropped the figurine on the floor. And there I was, I had to kneel down and gather together all of the broken pieces in order for me to pick it back up. And I'll never forget, forget thinking to myself, wow, I don't want a god 
that I have to pick up when it falls. I want to worship a God who will pick me up when I fall. Have I got a witness? Come on, is there anybody listening who can thank God that when you fall down, that the Lord can pick you back up? Somebody listening can testify that I fell down on my job. I fell down in my, I fell down in my finances. But when I fell down, I served a God who sat high and looked low and he was able to pick me back up. Have I got a witness here? Don't you ever put the resources of life in head of the source. That's why the Bible says that it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Because money makes people think that they can have a life that is independent from God. And this rich ruler has no idea what he has given over, the power that he has given over to the things around him. Jesus said in his sermon on the plain in Luke chapter 6, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall be put into your lap for with the measure that you give, it shall be given unto you. I regret that the brother didn't understand that had he given it over to God, then the Lord would have given it back over to him. This man was asking about the kingdom, but he didn't understand the kingdom. The kingdom wasn't about wealth extraction it was about wealth expansion from God's perspective there's enough for everybody have I got a witness I want to tell you that in God's kingdom there's plenty good room in my father's kingdom I wish the rich young ruler had asked the widow of Zarephath had he talked to her he would have discovered that regardless of how bad things get that the Lord will provide that the well will never run dry have I got a witness I wish the brother had asked that little boy who had two fish and five loaves what would happen if you put God first he would have discovered that when you give to God and put God first he'll multiply he'll press it down He'll shake it together and run it over. We'll be put into your lap. Come on, turn. I said, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't let your stuff get in the way. Have I got a witness? Oh, shucks, y'all not here. There's this story about a deacon in the church that the members of the church used to call the nice deacon. Everyone knew he was the wealthiest, the most educated, and the, and the most uh, traveled deacon in the church. They called him nice deacon because he was the most kind, the most cooperative, and the most giving deacon. Well, one day, one young man in the church in Sunday school asked him, uh, nice deacon, why do you waste your time teaching a Sunday school class like this? They say you're wealthy, you have a PhD, and you never tell anyone here about all of the things that you have accomplished. And the nice deacon looked at the young boy and said, because of God. And uh, uh, the young man said, what do you mean uh, because of God? And the nice deacon said, young man, everything I have, God gave it to me. <laughs> Any place I have been, God took me there. <laughs> everything I know, God taught me. <laughs> and the reason I'm still standing, <laughs> and the reason I'm still here, <laughs> and the reason I'm still teaching <laughs> is all because of God. I want to tell someone listening uh, that all that you have... <laughs> And all that you are is because of God. Have I got a witness? Come on, is there anybody who can thank God and testify that everything that I have, my job, my house, my family, God did it. Have I got a witness? Come on, type in the comment section. God did this. God healed my body. He made a way out of no way. Have I got a witness? And I'm still standing. I'm still walking. I'm still shouting. I'm still praising him. Because God did it. 
have. I got a witness. What this man didn't realize is that while he was looking for the kingdom, he was talking to the kingdom. He was asking about eternal life, but he was talking to life everlasting. Had he focused on Jesus, he would have realized that everything he was looking for was right in front of him. Have I got a witness? And I stopped by to tell somebody that everything you need is right in front of you. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get out of your way. Uh, everything you need is right in front of you. Type that in the comment section. Everything that I need is right in front of me. That reminds me of something that happened not too long ago. I remember not long ago, I took the kid, my kids to the mall. And when we got to the mall, all four of them asked me if they could have some money to go shopping around the mall. And I gave all four of them a hundred dollars and Ava and her two brothers took the money and then they ran off and went shopping and having fun. But Leah, uh, Leah, who can be a bit clingy at times, uh, Leah wanted to stay with me. Uh, she had her $100, uh, but she walked around with me. And as we walked around the mall, uh, Leah told me that when I recently tried to FaceTime her, she could not answer her iPad because her iPad was broken. I said, wow, baby, let's go then to the Apple store and get you a new iPad. Uh, a little while later, we walked past this other store, and Leah told me that her winter coat was getting too small. And so I said, wow, let's get my baby a new coat. We got her a new coat. Before long, we had gotten her a T-shirt from the American Girl store, some lip gloss from Sephora, and a necklace that she saw from a vendor in the middle of the mall. Well, about an hour and a half, later when the others returned, they noticed that Leah was walking with many bags. She had an iPad, a t-shirt, some lip gloss, and a necklace, and her siblings were looking shocked and incredulous, and they said, that's not fair. Uh, Leah, how did you get all of that stuff? And Leah, with her calm self, calm, cool, and collected, she looked at them and smiled, and she said, I got it because I stayed with my daddy. Y'all shout, y'all missed your shout. And then she said, not only did I get more stuff, I still got my $100. Oh, y'all missed your shout. Church, that's what happens when you keep God in his proper perspective. When you put God first and you stay close to him, he will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Have I got a witness? Somebody ought to be able to thank God that you have what you have because you stayed with your daddy. You're driving the way you're driving because you stayed with your daddy. You're living the way you're living because you stayed with your daddy. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he fight your battle? Won't he be a bridge over troubled water? Somebody shout, yeah, yeah. Oh, I feel my help coming. Come on, type in the comments. I stayed with my daddy. Come on, if you just stay with your daddy, you'll get everything that you're looking for. Yeah. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord some praise. Leah got what her siblings did not get because she stayed with her daddy. I want to tell you that if you would just stay with your heavenly father during good times and in bad times, he'll bless you, he'll keep you, 
that the thing that you're looking for in the material things of this world cannot buy you happiness. They cannot fill the void or the hole in your soul. That can only come by giving your life to Christ, by drawing closer to him and getting connected to his church. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org and look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. I created No Limits to help you strengthen your daily walk with God. And there is no better way to start your day than with the No Limits daily devotion email. Each devotion contains a passage from scripture and some insight to inspire you to feel God's love and to live a life with no limits. You can sign up today to start receiving the daily email by going to delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. Thank you in advance for signing up for the daily devotion email and I pray that it helps you to live each day with no limits. I have an exciting announcement for you. The No Limits free mobile app is now available for both Apple and Android devices. I wanna invite you to download the app right now. Simply go to the App Store on your phone and search for No Limits with Pastor Delman to find and download the free app. Or you can go to a special page on our ministry website to find the direct link to download the app. The page is found at delmancoats.org forward slash mobile. And with the No Limits app, you can watch my messages, read daily devotionals, access the entire Bible, and much, much more. And before I go, let me ask you for a favor. If you like what you see on the app, please tell your family and friends about it as we want to connect with more people to help them live a life with no limits. Thank you again for watching the message today and know that I'm praying for you to be strengthened in your walk with the Lord. And I ask that you please pray for me each time that you watch.